that we all are safe. I don't play accurately, anybody can play accurately, because I play a wonderful expression. <laughs> yes, sir. Have you got the cucumber sandwiches up for Lady Grapnel? Yes, sir. By the way, Lane, I noticed that in your book last week, you entered eight bottles of champagne as having been consumed. Yes, sir, eight bottles and a night. Why is it that in a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably end up drinking all the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the champagne, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely on first rate ground. Good heavens, is marriage so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant day, sir, although I've had very little experience with it myself up to the present. I have been married once, and that was in consequence. But this understanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I'm not interested in your family life, Lane. <laughs> no, sir, it's not a very interesting subject. I hardly think of myself. I'm sure. That will be all right, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Lane's view of marriage seems a somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set so good example, what exactly is the use of them? They seem to, as a class, have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. Ernest Worthing! What are you doing now? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. That's a great one anyway. You're eating as usual, I see, Archie. I find it customary that in good society, one of our taking slight refreshments around 5 o'clock. <laughs> Where have you been since the last Thursday? Oh, uh, you know, the country. <laughs> what do you do in the country? Uh, amuse people. And who are these people that you want to use? You know, the neighbors. Gosh, nice neighbors in your part of Shropshire. That is your country, isn't it? Shropshire, yes. Uh, I think you come with sandwiches and the extra tea. Who is coming over for tea today? Very on to last up. And when her... Oh, that perfectly delightful. That's all good and well, dear boy, but I don't think on to last will quite approve of your being here. Why would you say that, Algie? My dear boy, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. Well, I have come from town expressly to propose to her today. I thought you said you were here on pleasure. I call that business. How much of romantic you are, Algy? There is nothing romantic about a proposal. It is very romantic to be in love. But what is romantic about a definite proposal? Why? One may be accepted, one usually is, but then, well, the excitement is over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If I ever get married, I'm certainly trying to get that back. I'm sure you will, Algy. The divorce goes to make those memories are so completely possible. <laughs> Divorces are made in heaven. There's no use separating on the subject. Do not touch the cucumber sandwiches. They're made specially for Auntie Gusta. Do you believe in the war as well? <laughs> that is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. May I have some bread and butter? You may have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Wendland. Very good bread and butter it is. Fondest love. Adam, what is that, Adam? An aunt? No, 
size, out of size, big or little, should be allowed to decide the size of the aunt for herself. I admit an aunt may be small, but why an aunt would call her nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. From little Cecily, with her fondest love, to her dear Uncle Jack. As if you would just and let me By the way, your name isn't Jack at all, it's Ernest. No, uh, not my name is Jack. I have introduced you to everybody as an Ernest. You answer the name of Ernest. You look as if your name were Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I've ever seen in my life. Give me your car. Ernest Worthing, before the album. I shall keep this as proof that you have tried to deny me or Gwendolyn or anybody else that your name is an Ernest. How's it? My name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country. This is the great place to get to me in the country. That does not account for the fact that your small Aunt Cecily, who lives in Hundred Wells, calls you her uncle. Come, have the thing out at once. I will take my cigarette case back first. Use your explanation. The late Mr. Thomas Carby, who adopted me when I was a little boy, put me in charge of her granddaughter, his granddaughter, sorry, his granddaughter, Cecily Carby. She gave me a cigarette case out in the country. Simple as that. Where is that place in the country? I have no plans of ever telling you. And I will tell you candidly, the place is not Shropshire. I know, I bunger it all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. But why are you earnest in town and Jack in the country? <laughs> well, you see, when one is placed in a position of guardianship, one must adopt a high moral tone on all things. No, but that high moral tone cannot be said to do well for one's spirit and body. So, I've created a brother named Ernest that I may take into town and have a little fun with. My doctors say that I have always suspected you of being confirmed in secret bunbury, so now I'm quite sure. Why not learn this a bunbury, Stouchy? I will give you the definition of that incomparable term when you tell me why you're Ernest in town and Jack in the country. I will not explain it once already. I am earnest in town, so I may abandon that high moral tone, and I may have a little bit of fun. A lot of ways. You have created a permanent younger brother so that you may come into town as often as you like. I have created an invalid named Bunbury so that I may go up to the country as often as I like. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it weren't for him, I would not be able to dine with you this evening at Willie's, where I have really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a month. I have not asked to dine with you anywhere. I know, you are perfectly careless about sending out invitations. <laughs> Alzi, you had better go dine with your aunt. I have no intention of doing anything of the sort. And now that I know you are a bunburyist, I have to tell you the rules. Well, Alzi, I am sorry to say, but I am not a bunburyist or anything of that strange sort. If Wendell comes up and accepts me today, I am going to kill my brother. <laughs> At the very late, my cousin Cecily, my ward, is actually, in fact, far too obsessed with him. Well, nothing would induce me to part with Bunbury, and if you would ever get married, it seems to me to be extremely problematic. <coughs> <coughs> you will be happy to know Bunbury! <coughs> oh my, that must be Altagasta. Only predators in relative dream in that binary manner. You are smart. I'm always smart. I'm kind of You are quite perfect, Wendelin. Oh, I hope not that. That would be no good for the mother. I'm terribly sorry, Uncle Thorne, for being late, but I was obliged to find you Lady Harbury. I haven't seen her since her husband's death. I've never seen a woman so often. She has been quite 20 years younger. And now I'll come to you and we'll learn a nice little bit of her conversation, which is your home street. No, Sam. Yes. Certainly, I'll guess so. Bring in the cucumber sandwiches for Auntie Gusta. There were no cucumbers at the market this morning. I went down twice. No cucumbers? Not even for any money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. <laughs> I am greatly distressed. 
on Gasta about there being no cucumbers at market. Not even for ready money. Also, I'm going to have to give up the pleasure of dining with you this evening. My poor friend Bunbury is dreadfully ill and they seem to think that I should be with him. This Mr. Bunbury of yours seems to suffer from curiously bad health. He is a dreadful invalid. I must say, I think it's high time for Mr. Bunbury of yours to decide whether he needs to live or die. This chilly shower around the question is completely absurd. I would be obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury to not have a relapse on Saturday as I will long need to arrange my music. It is my last reception and one wants music that will encourage conversation. That, well, practically said, will, because everyone has already said what they had already had to say, which in most cases is probably not much. I will speak to Bunbury on Augusta if he is still conscious. <laughs> but I do think it will be quite well right by Sunday. May I take you into the next room to show you the program that I've gone out? Well, thank you. That's so very thoughtful of you. I'm sure it will be delightful. Why don't we have the spare backs? You talk to me about the weather, Mr. Ludwig. Whenever someone talks to me about the weather, I feel it means something quite different. And that makes me so nervous. Well, why not? I do mean something different. I thought so. In fact, I am very wrong. Ever since I met you, I feel that I've loved you more than any other girl that I've ever met since, well, since before I met you. I'm quite aware of that. And in public, often at any rate, I wish you'd been more demonstrative. There's something about you that has an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from different to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Willing, in an age of ideals. And my ideal is always that you love someone of the name Ernest. There's something about the name that inspires absolute confidence. You mean to say you really love me then? Oh, passionately. How well, then. My old Ernest. But you don't mean to say you couldn't love me. My name wasn't Ernest. But <laughs> oh. well, your name is Ernest. Well, yes, of course. But it's Ernest. <laughs> <laughs> so supposing it was, supposing it was something else. Do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Oh, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, it has very little reference to the facts of your life. The thing is, I don't feel the name Ernest properly suits me, that's all. It suits you perfectly. It's a divine name. It has music of its own. It produces vibrations. The thing is, Brendan, I feel that much nicer name. I feel the Jack. <laughs> it's a very, very good name. Jack? No. There's very little news in the name Jack. If any at all. I've known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. And besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for the name John. And I pity any woman who's married to a man named John. She'll never know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment of solitude. The only really said thing is that I missed. Oh, but you don't know how you made it. <laughs> I am one. I would like to take advantage of Lady Bracken's temporary absence. I would invite her to do so. Mm -hmm. Mama has a way of coming suddenly back into a room that I often have to speak to her about. Mm -hmm. I feel I must be christened. We must be, we must be getting married at once. Married, Mr. Gwendolyn. You've led me to believe that you have a considerable interest in me, and I clearly have a considerable interest in you, so... Yes, but yes. you haven't proposed yet. The subject has not even been touched on. Well, I've proposed to you. Mr. Zuelli, what have you got to say to me? Hello, I've got to say to you, better than. Yes, you've got to say it. Better than. You married me. Oh, yes, of course! Some men are most of practice. But one of them who I do not earn it. They are quite, quite blue. I hope you'll always look at me just like that, especially when the people are present. Mr. Griffin, the is most indecorous. Mama, I'm a baby to retire. Besides, Mr. Worthing is not quite finished yet. Finished what may I ask? I'm engaged to Mr. 
word Obama, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged, I will inform you of that. An engagement should come under your clothes of surprise, and it's hardly a match you should decide for yourself. And now I have some questions to put on Mr. Worthy. You, Gwendolyn, are making these inquiries and wait in the carriage. In the carriage, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn, the carriage. Men. However, I'm ready to enter your name to the answer to be satisfactory. Would you like to have a seat? I prefer to stand up. Do you smoke? I must admit, I, I, I do smoke. I'm glad to hear it. I mentioned always an occupation of some kind, but there are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? I am 29. A very good age to be married at. I'm of the opinion that men who is to be married should either know everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I don't believe anything should tangle in natural ignorance. Ignorance is like an exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. <laughs> what is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. That is satisfactory. Now we'll move on to more minor questions. Are both your parents living? I actually have lost both of my parents. Lost? That seems like carelessness. Well, it would be more proper to say that I was found. Found? Yes. You see, the late Mr. Thomas Carter, who adopted me when I was very young, gave me the last good word that he had because he had in his pocket a ticket to a word that it's a seaside resort it's in Sussex. And where did this charitable gentleman go into the seaside resort find you? Found me in a handbag. Yes, a, a black leather ordinary handbag with numbers. And where did this Mr. Thomas Carly find you in this ordinary handbag? Uh, in the cloak room at Victoria Station. The cloak room at Victoria Station? Yes, the, the right line. The line is immaterial. <laughs> Mr. Worthy, I must confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you've told me. To be born or to be very bred in a handbag, whether it is handled or not, seems to me to display an utmost contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life. It can only remind one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. But do we know what that unfortunate would have led to? Lady Barrett, what would you advise that I do in this situation? I can say quite candidly, I would do anything for Wendell's happiness. I would advise you, Mr. Worthing, to produce at least one parent by the sex by the end of the season. Lady Barrett, I don't know how I can do that to you, but I can certainly produce the handbag if you like. That should be more than satisfactory. Me, sir, you could only imagine that Lord Bracknell and I would even dream of letting our only daughter marry into a castle and form alliance with a handbag. Good day, Mr. Worthing. Well, dear Algy, 
I have no intention of telling her such things. And what about your brother, the profligate Ernest? I... I believe I will him. I'll say he died overseas in Paris uh, of apoplexy. Apoplexy is hereditary. It runs in families. You would best say a severe chill. It's just a bit chill. Is it hereditary? Of course it is. Then I will say, my brother Ernest died in Paris of a severe chill. Didn't you say that uh, Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in him? What would she feel his loss of a great deal? Uh, Miss Cardew. She's not silly romantic like that. Miss Cardew loves long walks. She loves to eat. And she hates, hates, hates her lessons. I would quite like to meet Cecily. I would take great care that you never do. <laughs> Does Wendy know that you have an excessively pretty woman who's only 18? Excessively pretty? As you, I'm sure by the time they've met, within a half hour they will be calling each other sister. Women only call each other sister after they've called each other a lot of other things first. <laughs> now, please, Ernest, if we want to get a good table, we'll at least have to go now. You know I'm going to get dressed. I'm a hunger. I never knew you would work. This From the expression on Mama's face, I feel we should never be married. And although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, I marry Arthur. But nothing she can possibly say will alter my eternal devotion to you. The story of your romantic origin, as related to my mama, has naturally stirred some of the deeper fibers of my nature. Your address is only here, I have. What is your address in the country? My address in the country, yeah. 245 Hertfordshire. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. I'll communicate with you daily. Oh, Gwendolyn. How long do you remain in town? Until Monday. Good. Roger, well, you may turn around now. Thank you, I've turned around. Yeah. I will see you at Fairfax House. Jack would allow us to be that unfortunate young man's brother. We might have a good influence over him in this prison. 
I do not think that even I can produce any contact with that. According to his own brother's admission, it is irretrievably weak and vacillating. You must put away a diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. I think if I did write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary we all carry about with us. Yes, but usually it chronicles the things that have not yet happened and couldn't possibly happen. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all three volume novels currently on shelves in our circulating libraries. Not to speak slightly of the three volume novels, Cecily. I would find myself in the movies. Did you really, Miss Prism? Was it ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript was lost. I see Dr. Tazbell coming up through the garden. Dear Dr. Charles of all, this is a huge surprise. And how are we this morning, Miss Prism? You are, I trust, well? Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good if to go for a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Seriously, I won't mention anything about it. Yes, but I felt instinctively that you have one. In fact, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the dear rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not an attentive. I'm afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon a list. I spoke about the board with uh, a poor astronomy I, I think to doubt that I will have a stroke with you. I find that you have a slight headache and I won't mind you. Good pleasure, Miss Prism. Good pleasure. Certainly, you will agree to put your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the whole of the room may have made it. It was somewhat too sensational. Poor geography. Poor, poor German. Sir Ernest Worthing has just arrived from the station. His drives loving with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing. <laughs> Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. Yes, miss. And I suppose you should talk to the housekeeper about her room for him. Yes, miss. I've never really met any wicked person before. I'm so afraid. I'm so frightened he'll look just like everyone else. He does. <laughs> you are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. I'm not little. In fact, I believe I'm more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily, and you, I see, are my cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. You mustn't think that I am wicked, really. I'm not wicked at all. Well, if you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very excusable manner. I hope you've not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and really being good the whole time. That would be hypocrisy. Of course. Well, uh, now that you mention it, I, I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. Now that we're on the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be proud of that, though I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. Deal with you. I don't understand how you're here at all. I'll come back, Jack will be back till Monday afternoon. So then I will be leaving by Monday morning. I am very disappointed. I need to miss. I think you should wait until Jack arrives. I know he's anxious to speak to you about your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating. He's sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, uh, dinner on Wednesday night, he said you'd have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. <laughs> Well, uh, after hearing the accounts of the next world in Australia, they're not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I am not that. You might make your mission to report me. I'm afraid I've done this afternoon. I might try to report you myself this afternoon. It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try it. I am feeling better already. Mm -hmm. You are looking worse. It's because I'm hungry. Oh, how thoughtful of me. I forgot that when one requires regular and wholesome meals in order to change their entire personality. I'm so sorry. Um, won't you come in? Might I have a logical first? I don't have an appetite unless I have a logical first. And what shall I have? I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink 
Rose come and sass me? Don't think the right thing. Talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things. Well, then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You are the prettiest girl I've ever seen. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They are a snare to every sensible man like the garden.
You must leave today by the 4 5 train. Really, it's perfectly childish to be in mourning for somebody who's actually staying a whole week. <laughs> and I am not leaving by the 4 5 train. If I were in mourning, you would stay with me. I would think it very unfriendly if you did it. I do I wish you would go. Your conduct in my house has been an outrage. Your discussions with Miss Cecily are frankly irrespectable, and I demand that you leave. Well, I don't like your clothes! <laughs> they are horrendous. If I may be underdressed, it has no time for the fact that you are notoriously overdressed all the time. If I am occasionally a little bit overdressed, I end up for my being immensely overeducated. As we, we must do, I have to say, this butter is not a great success for you. I think it's not a great success. <laughs> I am in love with Cecily, and that is everything. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He sent the dog card for me. Oh, are you going for a nice drive? No, he's sending me away. The dog card is waiting at the door, sir. It can wait, Mary Lynn, for five minutes. Yes, Cecily, if you don't mind my so openly saying that you seem to me to be in absolute perfection. Your frankness does you credit. If you allow me, I shall enter your remarks into my diary. You keep a diary? I would give anything to read it now. Oh no, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own faults and impressions. Now do go on, Ernest. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. I'm quite ready for more. <coughs> don't cough, Ernest. I don't know how to spell cough. <laughs> Cecily, ever since the moment I first met you, I have found to love you wildly and devotedly to go to sleep. The dog comes, wait. Let's <laughs> come around next time. Same time next week. Yes, sir. I don't think Uncle Jack would be very much pleased if he knew we were staying on to the next week at the same hour. I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anybody. The whole world is set to you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy. Why have you been engaged for the past three months? The past three months? Yes, it'll be three months on Thursday. Uh, how exactly did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother called Ernest, you, of course, became the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prisoner. Yes, say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Oh, <laughs> and when was the engagement actually settled? On the 4th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to not settle the matter one way or the other, and after a long struggle with myself, I finally accepted you in this very garden. The next day I went out and I bought this little ring in your name and this little bangle with the true love is not I promised you always to wear. Did I get this for you? Very pretty, isn't it? Yes. You have wonderful good taste, Ernest. That's the excuse I've always given for you living such a bad life. You are a perfect angel, Cecily. Dear romantic boy. I hope your hair curls naturally. It does. With a little help from others. I'm glad to hear it. You'll never break off now, Cecily, will you? I couldn't now that I've actually met you. Of course, there's the question of your name. Yes. Now, don't laugh at me, darling, but there's always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone with the name Ernest. There's something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. Pity me, poor Mary Rose, whose husband isn't called Ernest. But Cecily, you, you don't mean to say that you couldn't love me if I had some other name. What other name? Any name you like. For instance, Algernon. I don't like the name of Algernon. <laughs> Seriously, Cecily, are you saying that you couldn't love me if my name were Algie? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character. But you would never see my new attention. <laughs> your rector here is, I suppose, thoroughly experienced in all the rites and ceremonies in the church. Yes, Dr. Chasuble is the most learned man. He's never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. 
I have to go see him at once on most important christening. I, I mean, on most important business. What? <laughs> what an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. <laughs> I must enter his proposal into my diary. Mrs. Fairfax has just requested to speak to you. Ask Mrs. Fairfax to come here. Bring some tea. Thank you. 
sugar, and though I ask most distinctly for bread and butter in the beginning of the cake, I know the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I will warn you, Miss Harvey, you may go too far. To protect my innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other woman, there are no links to which I will not go. The moment I saw you, I distrust you. Miss Fairfax, let's clear our trespass on enough of your time. No doubt we have several other calls of a similar nature to make around the neighborhood. Ernest! A moment. Are you engaged to be married to this young lady? This lesson? Well, of course not. What could have put such an idea in your pretty little head? Thank you. I knew there must be some mistake. The man who was at present, his arm around your waist, is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. John! Ah! <laughs> Here is Ernest. A moment, Ernest. Are you engaged to this young lady? Good, good heavens! <laughs> yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. <laughs> no, of course not. Gwendolyn was such an idea, you're not pretty in your head. Thank you. You may. Algernon. Algernon. <laughs> Are you really called Algernon? I am. Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked. A gross deception has been practiced on both of us. Oh, my sweet wronged Gwendolyn. You can call me sister, won't you? <laughs> there is just one question I'd like to be permitted to ask my body. That's a good idea. Miss Gwendolyn, there is one question I would like to be permitted to go to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest. <laughs> Them. And both their answers 
be quite satisfactory, yeah. especially with Mr. Roydery. Yes, I'm perfectly pleased with, with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires me with absolute credulity. And should we forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. Oh. And that's true. That Christian name is still an insuperable barrier. Our Christian names? Is that all? But we are going to be Christian this afternoon. Am I saying you prepared to do such a terrible thing? That's yes, my mother. To please me, you're going to go through this beautiful ordeal. I am. Wait a minute. What is all this? It means I'm engaged, Mr. Worley, Mama. You're not engaged to anyone, dear. And now is your last No, Bunbury does not live here. Bunbury is somewhere else. <laughs> Bunbury died. <laughs> he died? When did he die? It seems awfully sudden. I killed Bunbury this afternoon. Bunbury <laughs> died this afternoon. Well, how did he die? Bunbury was quite exploded. Exploded. <laughs> Bunbury was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury could not live, and when when Bunbury learned that she could not live, Bunbury died. <laughs> I'm glad he has excellent confidence in his physician. He finally made up his mind one way or another. And now, Mr. Worthy, I must ask, who is this young lady whose hand went out and on in that holding? That is Miss Cecily Cardi. I am the engineer of Cecily I think some questions beforehand would not be out of place. Mr. Worthy, does Cecily have any relations to any larger railways in London? Well, Lady Bracknell, Cecily is actually the great granddaughter of Mr. Thomas Cardi. That is not unsatisfactory. So far, I'm satisfied. What are her records? Oh. Her records, I have records of her school, her christening, her baptism, her birth, and all of her vaccinations, whether it be English, uh, chicken pox, uh, German chicken pox, measles, it goes on and on. <laughs> what more would you like? That, that is a life of too crowded with incidents. I don't agree with any lives. That is too many events. Gwendolyn, you really should get going. I shall ask out of formality. Does Miss, does Miss Carl have any fortune of any kind, Miss Worley? Oh, any fortune? Only uh, 130,000 pounds, I believe. 130,000 pounds? Oh, yes. Now that I look at her, first <laughs> attractive, please send her here. Yeah. The clothes are usually plain and her hair is as nature would left it, but we can alter all that. Turn around. Right, right. No, I need to see the profile. Yes, Alma. She has good society um, in her life. Cecily is the prettiest, sweetest, dearest girl. I don't give two pence about good society. Don't say that. Don't be bad to society. That's what, the only people who are bad to society are people who don't want to Yeah, but the question of my consent still stands. Your consent? How old are you, Cecily? I'm 18, but I am mean 20 when I go to evening parties. 18, but I'm 20 when I go to evening parties. Then she should be out of your control. Well, Lady Bracknell, within the will that this Thomas Cardi left me, I'm actually a guardian until she is 35 years old. 35 years old? Algy, could you wait for me to have a certain part? Yes, I think I could, Cecily. <laughs> yes, I felt it instinctively. <laughs> I'm not punctual myself, but punctuality is a trait I admire in others, and waiting even to be married is completely out of the question. Then you must be considered, Mr. Worthy. Well, Lady Bracknell, I'm sure if you granted it your consent to me, when did it, I can <laughs> certainly think about it again. Mr. Worthy, you know that it's out of the question. When we have missed five friends already, we must be going. Is everything quite ready for the christening? What christening? Oh, Mr. Worthing, I mourn your sentiments. However, as a person who seems to be one peculiar and secular, I'll return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the past hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did you see Miss Prism? Yes, I have not on my way to join her. <laughs> Is this Miss Prism highly educated? She is the most cultivated of ladies, the very picture of respectability. That is obviously her. I must see her at once. She is nine. 